I'm very happy to introduce George Conadars. So I know George because he was our postdoc here for three years, two years, three, three and something years. Okay. So, um, and while he was here, uh, Tomas and I learned an enormous amount from him about planning and scheduling. And uh, you, George just barely made it here from the red line, which exhibits his expertise in planning and scheduling. No. Um, <laughs> But he's, um, you know, he's had a really uh, interesting trajectory and an important trajectory. So he, he did his undergraduate studies in Vatersrand in South Africa, and then went to Edinburgh, and then to Amherst, and then here. And he's been really instrumental in a lot of work on actually bringing AI to Africa and, and helping with people there, uh, helping students and supervising a bunch of people at the university and so on. So that's a great thing that he's done. And he has also done an enormous amount of really great work on, I think, bringing kind of an integrated view of AI, uh, which used to be kind of the way lots of people thought about AI, but it's kind of dissipated a little bit and people are looking narrowly and George really has got the whole picture in his head in a way that I think almost nobody else does. And so he will tell us about his whole picture. Thank you, Leslie. That's uh, incredibly kind. We'll see if the inside of my head uh, frightens any of you or weirds you out. I, I'll do my best to make it reasonable. Um, I, yeah, sorry I was late. I, um, it's a persistent cognitive failure of humans. To, they always chronically underestimate how long things take. Uh, and I'm an AR researcher, so like definitionally, I really chronically under underestimate how long things take, because otherwise I'd be in another field. So, but I made it here, MIT5, to the rescue. Um, so, so as Leslie said, I'm an AR researcher. Um, uh, and, and I would like to just briefly clarify that, that that means that I'm specifically sort of not building useful things. There are lots of people who build useful things with AI technologies. They, they design you know, products that we use every day. They can help you auto tag your, friend, face on friends, uh, your friends on Facebook and all that kind of stuff. I'm not one of those people. We have useful conversations, but we're not in the same field, fundamentally. Okay. So I'm interested in understanding how we design an intelligence. So, um, so as all these things do, it goes back to Turing. Okay, so this is Alan Turing in 1950. He wrote really the first AI paper on computing machinery and intelligence. And then in 1956 at Dartmouth, there was this conference um, where, the, uh, where the phrase artificial intelligence was coined. And this was really the beginning of the field, at least in North America. Okay, everything sort of descends from there. And the, and the underlying hypothesis there was that, um, was that largely speaking, functionally speaking, okay, everything is a bit of a cartoon here, but functionally speaking, the brain is a computer which is to say that you can apply computational uh, thinking to the brain, and also that it might be reasonable to build a computer with an algorithm in it um, that might replicate some functionality of the brain. Okay, so it's been 70 years since that happened, and we've made lots of progress. There's lots of exciting, cool things happening. On the other hand, when you go up to an AI researcher today, which I do frequently, and say, hey, so what is an AI going to look like? Like, not a, not a useful thing, but what's an actual general AI going to look like? How do you know when you're done? You know, what's the actual goal of your field they look a little embarrassed. And they sort of shrug and they go, oh, I kinda, I don't know. And then they go on with their day. And that should make you feel mortified. It makes me feel mortified. It's, a, it's an epic failure of thinking about what we should be doing with our lives. Like, what does this feel for? Okay. And it's totally fine. I mean, I have nothing against building useful stuff. Um, I'm, I'm all in favor of useful stuff. But, but you know, we have a scientific question that we're trying to answer, right? Which is how you design an intelligence. And when I'm like trying to do a piece of work, when I'm stuck writing a, a theorem or when I'm trying to write a program and I find myself blocked, like we have been for 70 years. I find myself unable to make progress. One of the strategies that I often take is to just add another assumption, is to just add one extra kind of um, piece of intuition or one other piece of structure, and then usually everything kind of drops out, right? Usually you're stuck means you haven't kind of added enough stuff to the problem. So a part of what I'm going to propose today is that we should add a thing to, a pro to the problem. We shouldn't just say that the brain is a computer. We should also say that humans are robots, okay? that, that, that it, in nature, brains are controlling bodies, okay? and that the fundamental function of the brain is to tell a body what to do. Its inputs are the sensors of the body, and its outputs are the actuators of the body. Uh, and that's what brains are for. Okay? And so theref therefore, whenever we think about artificially uh, and, and a general purpose AI, we should be thinking about a robot. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to attempt to briefly persuade you of that just for five minutes, because that could go on forever. And then I'm going to show you what I think is a kind of fully, um, fully is the wrong word, barely sketched out <laughs> okay. um, hypothesis about what it might mean to build a generally intelligent robot. Like how much leverage this extra assumption gives you. 
Okay? And, and I'm going to try and resolve the void that's at the center of our field, which is how do we put all these things back together again? So a lot of people here are cognitive scientists, uh, and that's wonderful. I love cognitive scientists, some of my best friends. Um, and they might say to me, well, okay, sure, every natural agent out there in the world happens to have a body. Okay, does that mean we need to be thinking about, um, about robots? And the answer is totally, because they're all, like, there are no disembodied intelligences, right? That thing doesn't exist. And so when you're trying to take insights from a natural intelligence and project it onto a computer and say, we should build an AI because, you know, that does planning because humans do planning and it should do computer vision because humans do computer vision and it should do um, scheduling because humans have to catch the train. Those are all things that robots do. Okay, there's no disembodied agents in nature. Not a zilch, none. Not a sausage. It doesn't exist. It's not even clear that it's coherent. And there's no reason at all to believe that the architecture of such a thing would look anything like the architecture of what you see in nature, which is an architecture built to control a robot. Okay, so, so in my opinion, if you're doing cognitive science, science, you need to take seriously the fact that the first few levels of control of the thing that you're thinking about is a robot. And people get a bit literal on this with me. They say, oh, okay, fine, you know, you need to avoid obstacles and recognize things in the world. But we get above that, and after that, we're not in embodied intelligence before, anymore. Everything's in, in embodied intelligence. Every input to you, to your brain, and every output goes through your body. You're 100% embodied. Every last thing, dreaming, writing a sonnet, playing music, all of that's embodied. Every last thing. Okay, so when we say embodied intelligence, and then there's the other type of intelligence, there's no other type in nature, none. And if you're, a, if you're an AI person, you might say, okay, fine, but I want to engineer useful things, and so why should I care about whether or not those useful things are a robot or not? And here I appeal to your sense of discomfort with what the field is, right? So AI is this collection of fields where we do planning because humans seem to do planning, so that sounds cool, and there's a subfield that does planning. And then we do learning because humans do learning, and that sounds cool, and there's a subfield that does learning. And then we do like natural language because humans do natural language, and that sounds cool, and there's a subfield that does that. But if you took those subfields, you know, if you took Russell and Norvig, which is the standard and very good AI textbook in the field, and you reshuffled the chapters at random, you would lose nothing because there's a void at the center of that thing. There's no notion of how these things get put back together. And you're not going to get that unless you root it all in a very powerful sensory motor interface with the world. All you need to be a robot is powerful sensors, powerful actuators, and being stuck in a loop with the world. Right. And so if, you know, if we want to be able to think about how we put these things together again, uh, it, it helps to have this clarifying hypothesis. And I think this is what we've always meant by an agent, actually. I think a robot's just a fully developed agent. Everything else is sort of a cartoon. People in AI say, oh, robotics is an application of AI. Actually, no, robotics is AI. Everything else is an application of AI. OK, so what I'm going to talk about today, and, and I'm just going to take that for granted, and I'd be happy to argue with you at length afterwards about the details of that hypothesis. It's not new to me, obviously. It's been around for a long time. I was indoctrinated in the 90s by Rodney Brooks, uh, late 90s, and I was very young, so just for age calibration purposes there. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and present, you know, sort of what we think the natural consequences of this are in terms of how we model a generally intelligent agent. And we're going to start out with a formal model because we have to agree with what the basic process is. And then we're going to think about how that single agent can, one single agent can solve many tasks. That's our definition of general intelligence is one agent able to solve many tasks reasonably well. Uh, and then we'll talk about whether that gives us leverage into asking and answering what should be innate versus learned. Uh, and then I'll just touch briefly on language. So the last two will be kind of brief. Most of the meat is in the second one, because that's where my technical work lives. Okay, so let's talk about this model. Uh, so in my lab, we like coming up with cool names for things. Uh, and so we call the kind of basic model that you get when you switch on a robot and you ask it for its what's happening, is you get a process that's running with the world, and we call that the ego process, right? It's the robot's innate interaction with the world. What's happening in that thing is, is you're getting some observations from your sensors, and they're rich and high dimensional because you're a robot, and of course they are. And we'll get into why that has to be true uh, in a minute. Um, and then you get to take actions in the world, and you're locked in this interaction loop, right? You, you, your actions change the world. The world changes in some irretrievable way, and then you get some sensor impact back. Okay? And this just is what happens when you switch on a robot. Right? Like if, you, if you take seriously that, that, uh, that the, the computational analog of a body is a robot, this is what you get. There's just kind of no argument there, right? You get sensors, you have actuators, and when you actuate, the world changes. Otherwise, you wouldn't bother. Okay. And what we're going to say is we're going to say there's this ego process running, and then we're going to think about a general purpose robot, so we're going to give it tasks. One task at a time, and we're going to model the task using something called a reward function, and that's quite a specific thing, but actually we're going to model it very generally. Um, but the idea is that there's some distribution of tasks you, which you may ask the robot, 
uh, and you're going to pull something from that distribution and you're going to hand it to the robot. Uh, and, then the ro and then that actually forms uh, a formal model called a decision process. Okay, some of you may have missed the word Markov in there because it's not Markov. Okay, it's just a decision process where you interact with the world. There's an observation space. There's an action space. There's a reward function that specifies your task. There's the transition. That's how the world works in the background, and you don't have that, and it's complicated anyway. And then there's this gamma term, which for now you should just think of a modeling term. It's like the probability that you'll be, it's one minus the probability that you'll be interrupted and be asked to do some other task at every time step. And just as a modeling choice, we're going to choose that as a geometric. So every time step, there's some probability that someone will say, hey, robot, stop doing that thing, come do something else. That's how that makes sense. Uh, and what we like to do is we'd like to generate an action from some policy. That policy is task specific, and it depends on your whole history. And the reward is task specific, and it depends on your whole history. And this gets you out of some of the awkwardness in reinforcement learning where you think about sums of reward. Because you can imagine just getting the reward at the end of the history, and that can kind of, you know, that can, that can uh, express rewards of whole trajectories. Or you can imagine that it's cut up into things that you sum. But this is kind of sufficiently general to do most of the things we want to do. Okay, and then what you want to do is you want to find a policy that maximizes discounted sum of rewards. Okay, and so this looks like reinforcement learning, a reinforcement learning style thing, except of course it's partially observable. It's like severely partially observable because the world is severely partially observable. I don't know whether it's raining or not right now, but that my future dinner plans are going to depend on that, and I just don't get to see. Okay, and so we call this a decision process. And that's the fundamental model. Like that's the ER model. Everything else has to flow from there. That is a description of what happens to the robot in the world. Okay. Now let's talk about why it's the case that it's hard for such an agent to learn to solve any individual task. If you take such an agent and you take such a formalism, you see that the robot's interacting with the world, not a task, but the world. Okay, so it's receiving the world in its full complexity through its sensors. And so you could imagine just taking something like a, an RL-style agent with memory and just, get, and just you know, sending it at this and, and saying, hey, just go maximize your policy. And that would work if you had like infinite data. Uh, but it's not likely to work for most real robots because we don't have infinite data and they live in the real world and time's a real thing and samples are a real thing, so we can't do things quickly. Now, when you aren't thinking of a general agent, when you're thinking of a narrow agent, you get away from this problem, right? If you're building an agent that plays Go, you get to give that agent an input space that's tailored to Go. You get to say it's a 19 by 19 array and your actions are legal moves in Go. And when you are building an agent that you know, does radiology, you get to give that agent, you get to say your input's an image and your output's like I've detected disease or not. And when you are doing Jeopardy, even natural language tasks, you get to say my input's a sentence and my output is a question. And if you're building one agent, that's totally fine. But if you're building a single agent that needs to do all of these things, then its sensory motor complexity needs to be big enough to contain any of them. Okay, it needs to be able to contain the union of all of them. And so we call this the sensory motor dilemma. The more general an agent is, the less well-suited its sensors and actuators are to any individual task. That's the core dilemma in general intelligence. If you want to build something that just plays chess, easy. You just you give it an input, and that's a chess board. And you give it an output, those are actions, and you're done. It's not that hard. But if you want to build an agent that plays chess and also juggles and writes a sonnet and you know, is able to do radiology and play Go, then you have to drastically expand its sensory motor space to, to cover the union of all of these things. And suddenly, it's not suitable for learning any of them. Okay, so the key question in building an AGI, I think, is how you overcome the sensory motor dilemma. Right, so if you want to learn to play chess, you could imagine giving a chessboard to an agent. Right? But a robot doesn't get that for free. Instead, a robot gets something like that. And it has to take this rich visual input. And from that rich visual input, um, it has to try and learn to play chess. Now, if we're given this, we can just drop in a completely generic alpha beta pruning algorithm and get to average club chess player level. Right? 1600 ELO is average club chess player level. We have an algorithm from the 70s that does that. Okay, so once we have the right representation, we're satisficing immediately. But instead, we get something like that. And we have to find a projection from that thing to the original task that reflects the complexity of the task, not the robot. Robots got to be complex. Otherwise, it can't be general purpose. Task has to be simple. Otherwise, you can't solve it. Okay. These are all the same position, by the way. So that compression into a state space has to be able to take all those three images and compress them into the same board. By the way, this explains why chess is harder for people than computers. Because if you're building a narrow agent, you get this for free. Of course, that's easy. But if you're building a general purpose agent, you have to go through vision to chess. That's why chess is harder than vision for people, but easier than vision for narrow AI programs. 
Okay, so if you're building a general purpose AI, you have a robot interacting with the world. If you're building a narrow AI that solves one problem, you just have a computer interacting with that problem and it's much easier, but it's also cheating. Okay, so whenever you read an AI paper and starts with, we're solving a sequential decision-making pro problem, we assume a state space that looks like this and an action space that looks like this, cheating. Okay, they've gotten rid of like 80% of the problem just by framing it. Just framing the problem is most of the problem actually. And if you're a general purpose agent, you have to do the framing yourself. If you don't get it given to you, that's uncool. Okay. So how might we do that? How might we build a robot that can do the framing itself on its own autonomously? And this is actually a well-formed question once we have this fundamental model. We can say that we have a decision process, and this is like the reward function added to the ego process, in which decision-making is crazy, right? You can't do it, yeah, that's nuts. Playing chess from pixels in, in like real in images is, is no way that's going to happen. But what you'd like to get is you'd like to get a decision process that's maximally compact, that expresses the complexity of chess, not the robot, doesn't have any robot parts in it, only has chess parts in it. And it turns out that you can do that, that's kind of well formed. What you need to do is you need to learn a perceptual abstraction, that's a mapping from your perceptual history to an abstract percept. And you have to learn an action abstraction, that's a, like a motor skill that you can run in the world. And if you put these two things together, the rest of them just sort of follow. You can build the rest of them automatically. As long as these two things match, as long as they mesh so that they form a coherent decision process, all you need to do to frame the problem is learn an appropriate perceptual abstraction and an appropriate action abstraction. And then once you've got that, you can mine the structure in these things, okay? So this is my favorite trick I like to pull. So imagine you've got this super complicated ego process, which is a decision process, which is formally like you can't solve, right? Like the complexity of that's very is nuts. Um, but if you start with a decision process and then you've built an abstract decision process and you eyeball its properties, you see that if it's observable and it's sequential, then what you have is an MDP. And you can swap in MDP solving algorithms for that. And so you can solve a subclass of decision processes that's much easier to solve. Similarly, if you take an MDP and it's deterministic, known, and discrete, what you have is search. So you can drop in a star and you can solve that more effectively. And similarly, if it's known and discrete and also happens to be factored, you can do classical planning, which is better than search. And if it happens to have adversarial-like uh, semantics, you can do adversarial search in it. So you just drop in your alpha beta pruning. You hypothesize that there's an agent out there. That's where the adversarial dynamics come from. You decide to connect some of your pixels to that agent, okay? because there's no other agents in your pixels when you're a robot. You switch the robot on, and it doesn't come with human detectors. You have to build that. You have to choose to model the world that way. Similarly, you can take a, a decision process if that's observable and not sequential, like it ends after one time step. And if it's got discrete actions, you have what's known as a banded. Bandits are easier. And if you have demonstration data, you have what's known as classification. Supervised learning with discrete actions. Uh, and if the actions are not supervised but continuous and you have demonstrations, then you have regression. Okay, so you can get to all the other classical AI paradigms by special casing a decision process. Okay. That's, why, that's what I mean when I say it's the ur process. You have a root process running on your robot. It's a decision process. Then you learn, you frame the task that you're, fr you're facing in the most compact way. And then you special case that task. And you say, hey, what general purpose algorithm can I swap in? Because you know, this happens to be a classification task, not a sequential decision making task. Okay. So what we imagine is a robot. And then we hand it a, a reward function. And it you know, learns the abstract representation that's appropriate for chess. And then it plays chess in that case. Or if you tell it to navigate through a city, it learns the appropriate representation for that. And it happens to be a graph. And you do search. Or if you wanted to play um, soccer, it, happens, it learns the appropriate abstract representation for this, which is continuous state and action, and so it has to do policy search. It has to lock in just the right algorithm, but they're all special cases of the decision process. So how are we going to do this? Right? That seems, you know, I've, I've shown you formally what we need to do. How are we going to learn these abstract representations? And that turns out to be complicated, as you, as you can imagine. Um, my lab has spent a lot of time on how you learn abstract actions, and I'm not going to talk about that today. What I'm going to talk about is how you learn abstract symbolic representations or abstract, abstract perceptual abstractions once you have the action abstractions. Okay. So you need to be able to account for grounding, like what do those perceptual abstractions mean in the world? When are they discrete? When are they continuous? When are they deterministic? When are they stochastic? Um, and, and you need to be able to phrase them in such a way that you can uh, support learning them. So in our approach is what we call constructivist because we like names like that. And it says, formalize the question that you're asking this abstract representation. Write it down in math, and then construct the representation so that by construction, you can answer that question. Okay. Um, so we started out with the simplest planning question. We said, 
okay, let's say you start with a start state. So we did this in the MDP framework for, for now. So we're just saying everything is Markov, but we're going to get to the more general decision process framework. And you've got a sequence of motor skills that you want to run in a row, and you want to know, can I execute it with property one or not? Okay, so what is the basic math of that process? Uh, it turns out that you can, you can answer that question always using some sets, one set and one set operator. So you start out with a precondition, that's the set of states from which you can execute that motor skill. And then you need an image operator, which is after you've executed the motor skill, what's the set of states you could land up in? And if you know these two things, you can compute whether you can chain these things by saying, I'm starting in some state Z, start set Z, not C, Z. And then you take an option and you can execute that motor skill if the Z lies inside the precondition. And if it does, you're going to land up inside the image. And then you ask, can I execute the second one? And you say, yes, if and only if um, th that image lies inside the precondition. And if so, you, are, you can land up in its image. OK, and you can write a proof like this for any sequence of actions. And the only thing that appears in it is the image, the precondition, and the start state. So if you can write those sets down, then you have a necessary and sufficient vocabulary of sets for being able to reason about whether you can plan. And what we're going to do is we're going to create abstract states that are names for these sets. And then we're going to tell you that you can execute a motor skill from those states if those sets lie inside a precondition. Uh, and then we're going to build a graph style representation computed that way that you can prove is sound and complete under some conditions. And we can throw the set thing away. And we can just plan with the abstract representation. OK. Um, some conditions under which this thing is, is a graph. Uh, there's this idea of a subgoal skill which drives you to a set of states. It doesn't really matter where you start. You're going to land up in some set of states. If it drives all the state variables to that set of states, then you can construct a graph. The only things you need to check is whether or not that set of states is inside the precondition of some other state. If so, you put an edge between the two, uh, two nodes. Each node corresponds to a skill. And you can just do search in that graph. Okay, So in that case, it's discrete. And the resulting, uh, resulting problem class is search. The more interesting case is when it's factored. So what that means is that some state variables are left alone. Other state variables are changed. The set that they land up in doesn't depend on the set you start in. That's called a, a factored subgoal skill. Like if you're a robot and you're picking up this object, you change the position of the object, the position of the robot, but like not the, whether the door that you, is leading here is open or closed. If that's the case, there's a bit of math, and you land up at strips, classical planning. Okay. That's where you get. You can upgrade this to ask um, a probabilistic question. What's the probability with which I can execute a sequence of motor skills? All you have to do is take that precondition set and turn it into a probabilistic classifier. What's the probability that I can execute a skill? from a particular point. And then you can take this image, uh, which is a set, and turn it into a distribution over states. What's the density of states with which I land up in afterwards? And if you could do that, then you can compute the probability with which you can execute a straight line plan. And also, probabilistic classifiers and density estimators are well-known machine, machine learning toolboxy things. So we can just pull them out of our toolbox. Literally, I pull them out of scikit-learn. And you can apply them to this problem. You go around in the world, you execute your skills, you get data of the form, I was in a state, I executed my skill, I landed up in another state, I got some reward. And in every state, can I run the skill or not? This is training data for a probabilistic classifier for your precondition. This is training data for your density estimator. Um, and you just kind of cut things up so that that abstract factored subgoal holds. And if you can do that, can't always do that, but if you can do that, you get a factored representation. So let me show you what that looks like. So this is an abstract, um, this was with Leslie and Tomas. Sorry, it took so long to come out. It was like five years working on this paper. OK, so, so this is a room uh, with a cupboard and a cooler. There's the cupboard. There's the cooler. And then there's a switch. There's the switch over there. Uh, and I just hand wrote the motor skills uh, using motion planning and a bunch of other stuff. And the robot can navigate between the cooler and the cupboard. And it can open the switch, turn the switch on or off when it's standing in front of the cupboard. And it can open and close the cupboard. But when the cupboard's open, it blocks access to the switch. You can't reach it. Uh, and it can open this cooler. But it can only open the cooler in the cupboard if it's got both hands available to it. And then there's an object inside these. You can see it, the robot holding it there that it can pick up if it can reach. When it's holding it, it holds it up here. It's a sort of big green object. Now, you could imagine writing down an MDP that's got like some tiny number of states that like very compactly describes this MDP. But that's cheating. So what we want to start with is we want to start with the motor skills. And we want to start with pixel inputs. And we want to build that MDP. OK, so not quite pixel inputs. What the inputs to the state space are posed in the map. 
voxel, a voxelization of the entire room. I've just cut out the cooler. Uh, and the raw joint positions of the robot. And if you give those motor skills to the robot and you ask it to execute, you have to execute about 160 skills. Takes a couple of hours. There it's turning the switch. Oh, I forgot to say, when the switch is on, there's a light on inside the cupboard. And it's so bright you can't see inside the cupboard. I had to find a very bright light. <laughs> um, wipe, it whites out the robot sensors. There you see it picked up that object, putting it inside the cupboard, closing the cupboard, closing the cooler. And so if you get this there, it can't open, uh, can't pick up the object because it's too bright uh, when the light's on. So if you run this, about 160 skill acquisitions, a couple of hours worth of data, and remember there's no background knowledge built into this robot, it's straight from voxels. We can recover some, uh, some symbolic representations. They're inarguably symbolic because they are a text file, okay? So it's a, in PDDL, this is a factored MDP. This says if you want to navigate to the cooler, the precondition is that the state is drawn from symbol one. And if you go into symbol one and you look, it's a distribution over the robot's pose in the map. And if you draw samples from that distribution, you see that the robot is standing up here looking that way. That's where the cupboard is. And then afterwards, symbol one will no longer be true. Symbol zero will be true. That's a dis also a distribution of the pose in the map. It's standing over here facing the cooler. And that will take about 37 seconds. Now, what's happened here is the robot has discovered the distinction between at the cooler and at the cupboard on its own autonomously just from data. And it's provably a, a sound and complete representation for planning with those motor skills. Okay, so the big assumption is the motor skills are present. Here's a more interesting one. If you want to open the cupboard, you have to be symbol one, so you have to be standing in front of the cupboard. Symbol three is a distribution over the robot's joints. And you'll see that the hands are down here. It's not holding anything. Okay. And then symbol three, uh, symbol four is a distribution over the voxels, and I just cut out the cupboard. The rest of it doesn't change much. This is what the voxels of the cupboard look like. You see that the cupboard's closed. Switch could be on or off. Lots of other stuff could be happening, but the cupboard's closed. Afterwards, the cupboard will be open. Possibly with an object in it, possibly not. Possibly with a switch on, possibly not. Not specified by this distribution. Okay. Okay, so the robot has learned grounded, some, a grounded symbolic representation autonomously, just given the motor skills. The rest of the stuff has happened. And if you give this to the robot and you ask it to plan to move the object from the cooler to the cupboard, uh, here's what it does. First it opens the, uh, first it opens the cooler and it notices that it uh, doesn't pick up the object because the cupboard's closed, and you can't open the cupboard if you're carrying something in your hand. So it moves to the cupboard, but then it doesn't open the cupboard because it has to turn the switch off first. So it turns the switch off, and it wouldn't be able to reach the switch if the cupboard was open. Then it opens the cupboard, then it goes back and picks up the object. Okay, now that is what classical planning classically does, right? That's not surprising once you have that representation that you can do that. It did it in four milliseconds, actually, because the input's just a text file, very fast. What's interesting is that we got to that maximally compact representation by applying this theory of how we build a compatible perceptual abstraction given the action abstractions. Okay, also, I asked it to clean up afterwards so it's going to close the cupboard and the cooler and do all that stuff automatically. Okay. The delay here, by the way, is, is for the vision. What's happening is it's merging the point clouds. I wrote this code and I'm bad at vision, so it's slow. It's about 45 seconds. Um, had I, had I had a grad student at the time who wanted to play with GPUs, that would have been instant. But the actual planning time is not, is not what's causing that delay. And then it goes back and it closes the cupboard. Uh, and we've applied this framework in 12 papers at this point. Six of them involve real robots. So it's now kind of reasonably well developed. So that's my argument. That's how you get over the sensory motor dilemma. You learn an action, a collection of action abstractions. You learn a collection of perceptual abstractions that match those action abstractions, that support planning with them. And then once you're in a representation that expresses the complexity of your task, not of your robot, then you can do problem solving. Okay. Okay. That's what I'm going to say about one agent many tasks for now. Now I'd like to talk um, about innate versus learned. Okay, so so far, what I th if I'm being grandiose about what the previous work does, is it sort of unifies the rest of AI with hierarchical RL. It says that the base thing is a decision process. You learn state and action abstractions over that decision process. And then you index into the structure of the resulting thing. And you sort of call out to various classical AI paradigms like search or classical planning or policy search. Okay. Um, but we haven't talked about robots yet. And of course, all that is very abstract, but anyone who's actually switched on a robot and done anything with it knows that you can't actually actuate your sensors and actuators directly like that in real life. You will immediately crash your expensive robot. 
you might damage a grad student or some other horrible thing like that. So let's think about how we might unify robotics with the rest of this stuff. And my argument is that we need to think about what should be built in to a robot. So here's my hypothesis. If we start with the ego process, and let's say we want to play chess, and we want to build a set of abstractions that describe chess compactly. We're actually going to do that hierarchically. We're not going to go straight there. We're going to build some layers. So let's say we learn those layers from scratch. And then if we wanted to navigate in a map, we would have to learn another set of layers if we, if we learned everything from scratch. And if we wanted to play soccer, we'd have to learn another set of layers if we learned everything from scratch. But you might find that these first couple of layers, which are, by the way, exponentially harder to learn than the later ones, which are nice and compact, these ones are high dimensional and continuous, recur over and over again. You're learning the same set of abstractions repeatedly if you learned your abstractions from scratch. And so you can imagine putting a line here. And you could say, stuff below this, I'm almost always going to have to learn anyway. It reflects structure in the world or the robot, not this individual task. And by the world, I mean either the world, like phys the physics of the world, like the world's 3D, and there's time, and you don't want to smack into things. But I also mean the distribution over tasks, right? That's a, that's, a, that's a property of the world. You're going to be asked to do some things, but not other things. Okay? So if we think about that structure, we would find that these things get learned over and over again, and they kind of belong to the world, the robot, and the distribution of the tasks, and it makes sense to build those in. That is what should be innate. Okay? So we imagine blocking this into something we call the sensory motor substrate. It's the, it's, the, it's the collection of things on top of which you learn a problem-specific abstraction. Below here is not problem-specific, it's kind of world and robot-specific and, and problem distribution. Above that is like, you want to play chess? That's never happened in your evolutionary history. So we're going to bootstrap off some layer in the sensory motor substrate and we're going to build an abstraction on top of it. Okay. So what do we want to include in these abstractions? What goes in there? Everything that exploits structure in the world, not a specific task. More specifically, structure in any, any element of the ego process, observation space and the action space. Structure in the reward function, distribution. Okay, if you're a robot that's always asked to do the same thing, like exactly the same thing, you should just build it in. There's no reason to learn. If that distribution, however, is, is broad and fat, then, then you are going to have to learn. And these things are always going to be coupled. It's always going to be coupled state or perception and action abstractions. That's the form of this knowledge. You always have to couple an input abstraction and an output abstraction. Okay. And so now if we look at the robotics literature and we go through it, because the robotics literature, I love robotics, I have a lot of fun in it. Sometimes robots drive me crazy. But what you find again is this collection of methods that someone thinks so you, will be useful in a robot, in many cases have been useful in a robot, but it's kind of disorganized. There's a bunch of things you could study, each one of which is probably useful on a robot someday. But if you go through it, you will find that most of these processes like SLAM and motion planning and object recognition and grasping can be thought of as action or perception abstractions. Okay. So like here's SLAM, for example, and I just got this off YouTube, but I think it's Creative Commons, so that's probably fine. Like, like this is the thing you can't think about doing anything on a mobile robot without SLAM, right? This is that you're driving through the world and you're, this is your sensor input space, which is massive and very partially observable, and you're building a map of the environment, okay? So you're going from that sensor input, which is very high dimensional and can only see in front of you, to your pose in a map, x, y, and theta, which happens to be Markov. And so what you've done is you've learned an action abstraction that takes that decision process and makes it a Markov decision process. And if while localizing you also happen to build a map, you've, made a, you've built a model of that Markov decision process and you can do model-based planning. You can do path planning in that map. That's the appropriate matching action abstraction that matches SLAM, which is a perceptual abstraction that exploits the fact that the world is spatial and that sensors work in a particular way to build a spatial abstraction that gets rid of the partial observability due to limited, limited, kind of, you know, limited sensor range. That's its role. And, and you really want to be solving Markov things if you can get away with it, because partially observable things are bad. Here's another one. This is robot motion planning, um, which Tomas invented, more or less. <laughs> um, so, uh, so here you've got robots moving through the world. And like you just can't treat this as a generic action space, right? There's all these obstacles. These are 900 kilogram robots. If you start to smack into things, everything goes bad. Even if you were as a human smacked into things all the time, everything would go bad. So what does motion planning do? It exploits the fact that the world is geometric and 3D, and it builds an action abstraction. I want to put my hand over here. 
Can you compute a policy for me to get there to there? Yes, you can by exploiting the fact that the world is 3D and you know your own kinematics. Okay. That's an action abstraction. Once you can operate in this space, just where your business end of your robot is, you don't need to think about where the rest of your body is. Uh, decision making is much simpler. So, what I would like to do is build a sensory motor substrate that consists of techniques, techniques from robotics, those are abstractions over observation histories, and take other techniques from robotics that are abstractions over actions, and then there are some techniques like IK or uh, inverse kinematics and forward kinematics, those are sort of processes that support those things. All right. So my bold claim of the day is that everything in robotics can be viewed as one of these two things or a supporting thing of one of these two things. And what we need to do is we need to be able to find the matching pairs of observation and action abstractions that, give, that put us in a much simpler decision process that exploits the structure of the world to be able to do fast learning and planning. <coughs> Once you've done SLAM, you don't need to worry about the fact that you can't see past your nose. You're in a map. And if you want to do navigation, it's path planning in a map. And that's not hard. And so, um, you know, we've kind of built up like a, a beginning sort of scratch estimate of what this would look like. We haven't done any of it yet. But you could imagine saying, okay, let's go into the robot literature and say, roboticists are wise. They know what robots need. They've built a bunch of technologies. And let's go pick up those technologies and try and organize them. And what we found when we think about that is that they've broken the world up into navigation and manipulation, roughly speaking. And then for each of those, you could imagine building, you know, starting with control, starting with like Boston Dynamics running around in the world. That's the first level. Then on top of that, you build a spatial layer, which hand, handles slam and path planning at the navigation side, and motion planning and spatial perception at the action side. And then maybe you jump up to an object level, where you start to think about the fact that mostly you're interested in manipulating objects. Uh, and therefore, when we want to go navigate, we want to go navigate to a place where we can interact with an object, or we can observe it on the navigation side. So these two techniques, action-oriented semantic maps and locally uh, observable MDPs, are coming out of my lab in the next year. Um, uh, Max Merlin and Eric Rosen are the two students working on them. They're very friendly. If you're interested, just ping them. Um, and then eventually, probably, we think after the object level, you get to, to object generalization. And I'd like to build like a single robot stack, not like a robot stack per problem, not like let's think about what this robot has to do today. Let's build a single robot stack, the way that you have a single stack, and be able to say, OK, when I want to learn a problem-specific representation, I can reach into somewhere in that stack, pull out the appropriate level of abstraction, and build on top of it. And that's how we think about unifying robotics, which you have to study if you're thinking about a generally intelligent agent. Because a generally intelligent agent's a robot, and the structure reflected in robotics has to be in some form around for people. OK, last bit. So I've got like three or four minutes till we get to questions. I'll try to leave a lot of time for questions, because I've said a lot of cranky stuff. Um, so I want to talk a bit about language, language about where I know the least. I have the fortune of collaborating with Stephanie Tellex and Ellie Pavlik, who are amazing language uh, researchers who think about grounding. Um, and so, uh, so you should attribute all the naivete that I'm about to ex uh, exhibit to them failing to see me this morning when I was on my way here. OK, it's, it's not my fault. Um, it's not their fault. It's my fault. Um, and and th the thing about language is, in this context is that it's special, because we don't get to design it. It is the case that there is an existing natural language out there. And if we want to build agents that use that natural language, we don't get to choose what, how they came to that natural language or what its form is. We just have to use a thing that exists out there in the world. Okay, it's not like the rest of the stack where we get to just say, hey, I want to use my computer vision algorithm however I like because I'm designing this agent and therefore I feel godlike and I can decide what it does. Instead, language is just language and we've got to use what we found. Okay. But under this kind of this view that you know, humans are robots, not computers, you have to say that language is a protocol invented by two robots to talk to each other. Not for anything else, not for tweeting, not for writing books, not for anything like that. It's for communicating between two embodied agents. Okay, and therefore, when you think about when you are grounding language, think about what, what, what language actually grounds to, is it has to be a decision process. Because that's, kind of, that's the sort of reformism. Shouldn't be thinking about grounding language into images or videos. Should be thinking about grounding languages into decision processes. Okay. So when I say, "Hey, robot, please pick up a stapler," and it's in this rich sensory motor interaction with the world, uh, what you imagine happening is that there's the structure. There is the bottom level rich sensory motor interaction with the world. Hard to describe because everything's continuous. Words not so great for that. And then on top of it is the sensory motor substrate, which will have things like objects in it. 
got to. Okay. And then on top of that, you will have a whole bunch of learned task-specific abstraction hierarchies, some of them about chess, some of them about soccer, some of them about navigating through Cambridge. And you're going to have to take that language and ground it into those hierarchies. And it's going to inform the decision processes um, that are in those hierarchies. So, that, so the generic object that it grounds to is a decision process in this formalism. Okay, so I think my bold, wildly under, unqualified to say statement of the day, okay, is that language should be grounded to decision process formulations. And then if you actually look at human language, uh, so, so reinforcement learning people, of, of which I am sort of one, don't like structure in their decision processes. They like unstructured Markov decision processes. They feel like structure in the decision processes is cheating. And that's because they haven't done robotics. <laughs> okay, so they don't know that it, it might be cheating, but it's totally, you just have to do it, okay? Um, but, but what I find really striking is if you look at the structure of language, if you just look at parts of speech, and I only speak English, so I'm sorry I'm being like chauvinistic and only looking at one language. I, I speak, I can swear in a bunch of other languages, but English I can, is my only, is the only one I, I was made to study grammar in that I remember. Um, you know, the fact, if you, if you imagine that language is grounding to a decision process, the fact that humans have verbs which are discrete names for actions mean you have to have action abstractions. You have to have discrete action abstractions in order to name them with discrete names. Okay. And similarly that we have nouns and common nouns means you have to have objects. You can't be in a Markov decision process or a decision process. You have to be in an object-oriented Markov decision process. Otherwise, you can't have nouns and you can't have common nouns. It has to be a typed object-oriented decision process. And the fact that you have adjectives mean those objects have attributes. And the fact that you have adverbs mean that those motor skills are parameterized by real-valued parameters. Because if you say throw the ball higher, you have to be able to adjust your motor skill to throw the ball higher. Okay. So to RL people that are thinking about grounding language into RL, you have to say the language suggests that the model that you want to ground into is very structured. Okay. Uh, another, another thing is there's no reason to have declarative statements about world state unless you're in a partially observable Markov decision process. I can't say the staplers in your office if you're in an MDP, because you can just observe that at every, every time state. Okay. This doesn't make sense if humans are in an MDP. So we wrote just like a workshop paper. To just, it was just kind of an amusing thing. Uh, my student, Rafael Rodriguez Sanchez and, and Roma Patel, who was a PhD student at Brown, just said, OK, let's take all the different types of structured decision processes, and let's like say, OK, what parts of speech make sense in each of them? And you can see that it's like really clear that, you know, like MDPs, most of the language doesn't make sense in MDPs. It's just no reason to have it there if what you're grounding to is an MDP. But if you're a decentralized, that means there's other, other agents who don't see everything that you see. Object-oriented, that means there's objects in the world. Partially observable, that means you can't observe everything MDP, then a lot of these things make sense. But those structures have to be there. The other route that we've been sort of, um, oh, and, and I should say that the, the symbol thing kind of makes sense as a sort of grounding target as well. So this is a paper by Nakul Gopalan, who's now an assistant professor at Arizona State, but was Stephanie Telex's PhD student. Um, this is a case where we uh, took robot demonstration trajectories, segmented them into subskills, learned the symbolic representation suitable for planning with them, and then took a natural language description of that trajectory and mapped it, like just did machine translation from the natural language description to those symbols. And then we were able to set the robot a goal and have it, you know, have it describe the sub-goal and then have it plan to the sub-goal because it had the underlying substrate for planning. Okay, so these things can kind of work together a little bit too. Um, the last thing that I'm going to say that we're working on uh, is, you know, we've been thinking about, well, there are these really, really successful approaches to, um, uh, to, to doing machine translation now with kind of big language models. Okay, so what we've been thinking about is, okay, for just, just for MDPs, just for the simplest case, is there a language that can express anything you might wish to say about MDPs, a formal domain-specific language? Can you write down advice in that formal domain-specific language that, that is by construction grounded in an MDP? And then can you do machine translation to that language? Um, so my student, Ben Spiegel, who's in the audience, and also Rafael Rodriguez Sanchez have been working on this. This is called RLang. It's a, it's a language for, dis for giving advice to reinforcement learning agents. Uh, and very soon you'll be able to give that advice in a natural language and it will be translated into an RLang program that's just a machine translation pro problem. Now an MDP is very limited, it's not very powerful, but it is a very natural way to be able to give advice to reinforcement learning agents and we think it's some evidence that you know, it, it, there are reasonable ways to try and get from language to these structured um, 
structured decision processes. Okay, so just to close up, um, what I've talked about today, big AR model, we've talked about the fundamental model, the Ur model, that's what you get when you switch on a robot, and you're all robots, okay, not computers, and that's a decision process. Uh, and I think that that's the, the mass, sort of maximally general thing you could be asked to solve. And then we talked about how you would have a, a robot solving an extraordinarily powerful, like wildly overkill decision process and the, uh, for every task it may, be wish, may wish to solve. And our kind of answer to that, how you resolve the sensory motor dilemma, is that you learn a task-specific representation that captures the complexity of the task, not the robot. Okay, you should get the same description of chess whether you use a six or seven degree of freedom arm, whether you have an HD camera or an SD camera. It's not about, you know, you have to bridge that gap between the robot's complexity and the complexity of the task. And if you can do that successfully, then we have a natural route to being able to pull in all the formulations from the rest of AI, and special case the man when the decision process has the right structure. Now we talked about how that gives you a lever for thinking about what should be built in and what should be pre, uh, what should be learned. And our argument is that what should be built in is the set of abstractions on top of the ego process. That's paired action and perception abstractions on top of which you can rapidly learn a task specific abstraction. And those are things that reflect the structure of the world or the reward distribution or the robot, but not any specific task. And then we've talked about how language and we can think about grounding language into, into sequential decision making processes. Okay, so this is, this is the, if there's, anything, if there's a single thing you take away from this talk, it's this picture. This picture of a robot going around being given tasks with a really rich sensory motor space, then constructing abstract representations of those tasks and then exploiting the structure that it can see in those decision processes because it built them and then swapping in the right uh, algorithm of the right complexity. Okay, that's it for me. Questions, thank you.